Hey what's up everybody, it's Kellen here from Start Your Systems and welcome to our MXGP career mode game playthrough here on Start Your Systems. This, this is uh, the, the, the flubs. Uh, this is episode 7, part 7, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and move right on to the next GP, which is Majora. And we've already ridden this track, if you may recall, uh, when we did the wild card race in MX2 to start the whatever this is, the career mode. Um, and that was basically last season, if you want to call it. But now we're in the middle of the MX2 season, and Majora is like round 9, I think it is. Somewhere in there. So we're going to do Majora and then whatever the race is after that today. And then I'll end it by probably going and doing some... Uh, either buy another bike or something to get ready for the next episode. And we'll have a good old fun time today. Um, transmission. Go with high. And go to track. So again, we're sticking with the uh, same uh, format that we've been doing on these videos a whole or at least since like episode three or four, where I'll just go out, qualify, do one lap of qualifying, pull it in, and whatever my lap time was is what I qualified with. And then we'll do the two motos, three laps each. We're on realistic difficulty, realistic physics. And so you get to see basically the whole shebang, and I'm still riding this pretty much bone stock Husqvarna here. I do have enough credits to upgrade it, but I figured last episode we actually kind of hung with the pack for most of it, most of it, except for the uh, second race in uh, France, sorry, that just kind of walked away from everybody, but we'll see how it works at Majora, whether that'll happen again or maybe something different. I think, I think if I get an opportunity sometime soon to join the team, then I will. If it doesn't happen this episode, then I'll probably buy a, uh, a different bike than the one I've already got, which is now I've ridden Suzuki, Husky, and Yamaha. So all we have left is um, Honda, KTM, and TM. So got to pick one of those, ride those, and whichever one of those I don't pick, will be the team that I joined probably to finish MX2 season. Uh, which is, I think this is 18 rounds. I think this is like a full 18 round championship as it would be in real life. So that's pretty cool. And over the line, not gonna get top time second, but just barely second. All right, back to the pits. Go to sessions, skip to race one, yes. Ended up eighth. I think because these this track's hillier, that the uh, stock bike isn't going to be as successful. I say stock, but I do have race tech suspension on the bike, so there is that. But other than that, no pipe, no brake discs or anything special like that. Still have the championship lead though, so we're we're doing that well enough. In between Lieber and Seaward, and I got a terrible jump. I'm gonna get pinched. Oh, I came out with a pretty good start. Came out in fourth, trying to get to the inside of Seaward, ran it a little too deep. No power. And these guys have more power at the top of the hill, so they try to jump by me. Jeffrey Hurling's all over on my backside. I'm in between him and Seaward, who this past weekend in Germany had a little bit of a scuffle, if you will. Um, what I gather, I didn't. Really, I mean, I watched the race and I didn't see anything terribly drastic between Seaward and Hurlings. Hurlings was under the weather the entire weekend, um, and that was brought about numerous times on the broadcast and stuff like that. That he was feeling ill and that his perfect season might be in jeopardy and la 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 la. And uh, I guess in the second race. Uh, hurlings had to come from a little ways further back than normal hurlings would have to do. Um, ooh, that's not good. And uh, Anstey would have probably won that second moto had he not crashed, but Seaver was leading the race pretty late in the second moto. And hurlings caught him, and they tussled for, I don't know, three or four, three or four laps there at the end, and then hurlings passed him. 
pulled away with about two laps to go. And then after the race, I come over the line, you know, Hurlings pumps his fist over the line and whatever, but then he pulls right off to the side of the track. And it looks like he may just be like catching his breath because he's, he's sick, so he's not able to breathe as easily or whatever. But no, when Seaver pulls up next to him to like congratulate him or whatever, Hurlings kind of flips out and starts yelling and pointing at him and all this, that, and the other thing. Apparently, according to Hurlings, um, this was later on his Instagram account, but he also said a, a bunch of stuff after the race too that that Seaver was cross jumping him all over the track, and he even cross jumped him really hard on uh, the uphill triple step up, which I assume he was talking about the one at the very back of the Tau Kessel circuit in Teuschenthal. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I, he just kind of freaked out on him. And Hurling said that he hurt both of his ankles because he had to come up short on this uphill triple, not running into Seaward in midair. Like he checked up and, and ended up coming up really short. So he was all, I mean, he's got a little bit of a point in saying that, like, yeah, he's been very, in, he's gotten injured um, these last couple of years and he doesn't want to have something stupid happen again to, to re injure himself. So, in that aspect, you can kind of understand where he's coming from, but. Um, I don't know, I think in general there's just this kind of like growing disdain of, of riders like doing this cross jumping stuff and whatever and uh, my theory about cross jumping is that yes it's, it's very dumb, it's very uh, you know it could get people hurt and it's kind of bad racing etiquette and all that business but there, there has to be a certain point where the rider in front doesn't always know exactly where the rider behind him is going to be and the rider in front is just picking and choosing his lines and he's trying to defend his lines so that the rider behind him doesn't pass him you know by just taking the inside line away or whatever so he has to come to the inside and I get that doing it on a jump is is not as safe and kind of a stupid move but it happens in motocross and I mean Cooper Webb blew his lid last year at Marvin Muskan for supposedly quote cross jumping him at Washougal and uh, that was a mud race, so, I mean, if we watch Vegas this past weekend, there's quite a few people doing some cross jumping because there's mud on the ground there, so I don't know what, you know, Webb was really thinking about, but, I mean, Webb was probably just as sketchy as Marvin that race, and I thought it was kind of silly that Webb called him out for that. I think cross jumping is stupid when you're in a pack of riders. That's when it's ridiculous, but if it's one-on-one, -on -one, mono -y mono then it's a little bit, I think, more acceptable because you can kind of prove that you're trying to defend your line and not just being an idiot like I thought James Stewart was in 2010 when he cross jumped the field in 15th place in his heat race which ultimately ended his season at Phoenix so you know I, I, I think Hurlings definitely overreacted to that situation I you know Seaver obviously had no idea that he had done anything wrong because he pulled up and congratulated him and when Hurlings started freaking out he was like what man like I, I don't even know what you're talking about like I didn't even do anything to you so um, I thought that was that was just a little bit kind of chicken shit from Hurlings because like you're dominating the world championship right now You didn't need to win that second race if you thought Seaver was being a crazy prick slow down and finish second I know you're trying to keep your perfect season intact But you're sick this weekend and you win your championships on your bad days and honestly that was So far your bad days So I would you know if you're trying to win the championship and be safe Then don't get involved with someone you think is riding unsafe. Just let him go but I guess that's just my point of view on it. You know, it's I'm not a professional racer. I'm just speaking my opinion. I think Hurlings is a fantastic rider. I think Seaver's a great rider too, and I think it's just kind of silly that Hurlings seems to get up so upset about these little things, um, especially when he's so far out in front of the championship. But you know, I'll probably get a little bit of hate for saying stuff like that. That's understandable. You know, everybody has their opinions, and I I, I get that. I always love hearing your opinions as well. I'm just voicing mine and. You know, if you like it or don't like it, I'm sorry, but that's just how I feel about it. I think regardless of what happens, Hurling is Hurlings is still going to win this world championship. I mean, we're now seven rounds into the, t the championship, and he's still perfect. Um, so we're only two rounds from halfway, and he's almost still got a perfect season going, which is ridiculously hard enough to do. Um, and he has to try to do it for I think 18 rounds is the uh, is the tally so 
I don't know if he's going to do it. I don't think he will. I think there's going to be more weekends like this one where he's either sick or maybe get gets a little injury and it just holds him back from being his absolute best. But I still think that he's going to just go ahead and walk away with this championship. And I hope that means that he moves up to the MX uh, GP class next year. Kind of talked about it in the last video that I did on the last Tuesday, the MXGP Part 6 career mode video. Um, and, you know, I think Hurlings, when he moves up, is, is still going to be the guy. Um, I, I, I There's a couple people saying, like, wow, I can't believe that you said Cairoli's washed up, or I, I don't know what the exact verbiage they use, but, I mean, what I was trying to say about Cairoli is that this year, it seems, and a little bit of last year, too, like, it wasn't the same dominant Cairoli that we've seen. I still think Cairoli is very capable of winning races. I mean, obviously, he just won in Germany this weekend. I think he's very, very capable of still winning this world championship. I'm just trying to like look at it from a point of view that says, well, the last six years before Fever won his world championship, Cairoli was almost untouchable. I mean, yes, there are some years that DeSalle would get in there and mix it up, but then Cairoli would just walk away. And there are some years that... Um, you know, Noggle got in there a little bit. Paulin was good in like 13, messing messing up, uh, not messing, but getting in there and beating Cairoli every once in a while. But this season and last season, it's just not the same Cairoli from what I've seen so far. I think he's going to need, like once he gets completely healthy, he'll start getting back to the point that I think we know Cairoli can ride at. And I, we saw, we're starting to see more and more glimpses of it. I mean, he rode really well in uh, Germany this weekend. Geyser passed him in that first race. Cairoli immediately passed him back and then pulled away from him. So it wasn't like Geyser was definitely the faster rider on the track until he got to Cairoli and then Cairoli turned it up another notch. So I think he's finally getting his mojo, if you will, um, which is good to see because I, I think Cairoli still, as I said, has world championships in him. I don't think he's washed up yet. I don't think that uh, this is the the necessarily end of his career that we're watching or anything like that he's still got a lot of fight left in him but i would say that his days of literally destroying the class like he used to are over i think fevra and geyser have proved that these young kids are going to move up and challenge and i think if and when hurlings does move up to to go up against kairoli in that class um kairoli will have a pretty tough time dealing with hurlings i think at least but I mean, who knows, when, when Hurlings does move up, and if he does move up soon, hopefully, um, you know, it still could be a, a Cairoli show, and it really just could be that Fever and Geyser were that much better on 450s. I really didn't expect Fever to be that good on a 450. Kind of expected Geyser to be, because I've seen him ride at the Destinations for Slovenia before on a 450, and, and he's been good. So, you know, I, I could see Geyser being as good as he has been, but last season, Fevra blew my mind, and uh, he still is to this day that he's he's that good and, and running with those guys and is a world champion. I mean, good for him. Like, kudos that he jumped up to a 450 and, and took advantage of one of the craziest MXGP seasons of recent date and just kind of slid through and won the world championship. But, man, that, that, whole, that whole season was out of left field for me. If you had told me going into 20... 15 MXGP with Villapoto and Cairoli there and a healthy DeSalle and Noggle and Paulin and all those guys that Roman Fevre would have been the world championship I would have said I'm not even going to bet a penny on the guy winning the title and I think there's a lot of other people that would agree with me so that's just to show that I mean that just goes to show how out of left field his championship last year was in my opinion <clears throat> and we're done here at Majora and got some credits Ya ya ya, credits and a reputation. Hey, look, it's Arco de Trento. All right, and right into the next race, which is Teutschental. Hey, look, right where we want to be in, in uh, Teutschental. Someone on the channel commented recently, I think when Jeremy and I did MXGP online play 15, maybe 16, uh, we did it with a fan that one day. And we rode at Teutschental, and I mean, Teutschental, Teutschental, I mean, I don't know the exact way to pronounce it, but I'm not German. I tried to speak German before, took two semesters of it in college, didn't work. Uh, so 
Yes, my last name is very German, heavily Germanic descent. But that doesn't mean that I know how to pronounce German names correctly, so I apologize for absolutely botching uh, Teustenthal, which is how I think it's pronounced, but our German fans will come through and let us know. But yeah, this was the, uh, the GP that they just raced this past weekend, where uh, Hurlings went 1-1, as stated. Cairoli 1-1 dominated well sort of dominated I mean he never really got any further away than like three to five seconds of any of his competitors that that whole uh, both motos really but yeah he, he looked good Cairoli definitely was starting to look like strong enough to contend for wins again and these uh you know these riders are always kind of momentum riders is what I would like to call them in that it you know it takes them a little while to figure out the you know the winning combination or whatever but once they do they they know what they need to do to win these races again and then they start clicking off wins um, it's it's true for a lot of riders in the series I mean we've always in the media that is always talked about Chad Reed as kind of being a, a head case kind of guy where as soon as he wins a race watch out because Chad Reed is just gonna start killing you and I mean, we almost saw it last year in 2015 once he won Atlanta, then came out the next uh, round, uh, the, the second Atlanta that was, got a start and was running up front, could have had Pike for lunch probably, but crashed by himself unfortunately. So you know, I think Cairoli, we could start seeing him click off wins, which I would actually like to see, because Fever and Geyser have developed a pretty good size lead on Cairoli, now third in the championship, and uh, I think they're... Geyser leads the points. He leads the points by eight on Fevra, but he's 36 up, I want to say, on Cairoli. So I think if Cairoli starts clicking off wins, claws his way back into this championship while Fevra and Geyser are kind of duking it out amongst themselves as they have been for these first seven rounds, that come season's end, we're going to see some, some really special things going on in that MXGP class. I mean, the series are, itself is already pretty dang epic. There is some crazy things going on in Germany this weekend. Uh, the wind was really, really gnarly, I guess, at the track, and it was kind of a cold day. Um, Van Horbeek and Fevre got into it in the first moto. I guess, from what I hear about it, the report was that uh, Fevre took Van Horbeek's gate after the parade lap, and Van Horbeek was pissed, or not happy whatsoever about it, and so on the opening lap of race one, uh, they were together, and Fevre gave him little to no room after the finish line jump going into the U-turn uh, there. Uh, I already ran a lap, didn't I? Oh yeah, what am I doing? I'm just kind of babbling on and riding around. Whoops, didn't want to do that. Uh, anyway, so they uh, collided in the corner after the finish line jump on this track, and Fevre went down, and he went uh, pretty much all the way to the back. I mean, those Yamahas have electric starts, but he, it, it took him a little bit to get going because he more or less got like punted out of the inside rut so he actually fell off the bike like kind of hard so um i guess i mean fever ended up 10th that moto and i think uh i want to say van horbeek was fifth and uh from what i understand the guys at the yamaha tent were none too thrilled with van horbeek about that one and i guess they've thrown uh, the water under the bridge about that one but i'm not too sure Regardless, the second moto, Van Horbeek had a ridiculously big crash on that same finish line jump. Because, um, like I said, it was kind of windy, I guess, and he took off the jump, and the wind caught him, and it just sent him to the left side of the track, and he landed in. See, see MXGP lately has put all these banners around the side of the track. They used to have, like, a green fence that, like, determined the track boundaries, but now they just have those Aturbys, uh stakes. And then they have all these like banners and stuff put around the track, like on the left side here, the Pirelli banners, the MXGP banners and stuff like that. Uh, essentially, Van Horbeek went off the finish line, floated to the left of the jump, which I'll show you here in a moment, and landed in those banners and just yarded hard, like really bad. So he landed basically where these GoPro banners are over there on the left. Um, definitely I would look it up on YouTube to see it, because he crashed hard and then was pretty quick to get back onto his feet and he kind of hobbled back to his bike. I don't think he ended up finishing the race. He definitely fin did not finish in the points. But it was a big, big crash. Um, very, very gnarly to watch for sure. 
So, very eventful weekend for the Yamaha boys and Van Horby coming. Fevre went 10-3. He kind of looked off of his normal self. Yes, he had to come through the field in the first race, but even in the second race, he caught late in the race but couldn't pass Evgeny Bobrashev. So, Fevre was a little bit off that day. As it seems like he has kind of been these last few weeks. Geyser looked great again. Um, Geyser went 2-4. Uh, and Geyser probably would have went 2-2 or maybe even 2-1, but he crashed uh, with Evgeny Babrashev. Oh! In the, uh, they went through the mechanics area and they crashed on like the 6th or 7th lap of race 2. And he got passed by 6 or 7 guys, got up in 8th. And then had to pass his way all the way back up towards the front again, ended up 4th. By the time he got up to 4th, Fevre was already pretty far gone ahead of him, so he couldn't get him. But he's leading the World Championship now again. Eight points up on Fevre, as I said. So it's a pretty epic world championship to watch, that's for sure. Um, this one is getting good. Seven rounds of 18 done. And uh, they're racing again this weekend in... Uh, are they in Arco? Might be in Arco de Trento. It's in Italy. I'm pretty sure it's Arco. Also known as Trentino. I'm not sure what name it goes under in this game. If it's not... Trentino than it would be uh, Majora, I assume. Pretty sure it's Trentino. Also, shout out to the uh, fans that let me know in the uh, comment section on this in these videos when I asked about it uh, two episodes ago that Assen still is on the calendar and is the Grand Prix of the Netherlands as the uh, Valkensward race is actually the Grand Prix of Europe. So there's that. And then I think, I think, in America, in the uh, U.S. races this year, the Charlotte race is going to be called the Grand Prix of the Americas. I could be wrong. And then the uh, Glen Helen race is going to be the Grand Prix of the USA. Monster Energy Grand Prix of the USA, Glen Helen. I'll be there, will you? Should be there uh, with Zach Dupuy, actually. We've been talking about it. Zach Dupuy, uh, team rider for SYS Racing and MX Simulator should be uh, coming out staying at my house well we'll be there all uh, most of the weekend probably so say hello if you see us but that's forever away from now so you probably won't remember by then uh, in the meantime I could talk about outdoors our um, nationals outdoors around one of Hangtown coming up uh, what I guess I should say before that is we're going to be a little bit slow on videos on the channel for the next two to two and a half weeks, I would say. Um, I have finals Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, these next, I mean, this video is coming out on Tuesday, so basically the next uh, eight days in front of us, I have finals on five of them. So lots of studying for me. And once I'm done with finals, I graduate on the 22nd from college, so I'll be super busy getting graduation plans ready. My girlfriend gets her master's on Saturday and then backwards gets her bachelor's degree on Sunday. She hasn't finished the master's program yet that she's in, but um, she still gets to walk with the master's students. And I get my bachelor's of comm studies on that Sunday. So I'll be graduating and hella busy, and Jeremy's still uh, very busy himself. Trying to get his personal trainer's license, working at a gym lately. And hopefully once all that settles down, then we'll be back on the full schedule, pumping out really good content. But it's just kind of the idea of what's going on in these next couple weeks. Well, we will be covering the opening round of the MX Simulator uh, National Championship at Hangtown. And that will take place on the uh, 19th of May. Yes, 19th of May at Hangtown. Should be about the same time, I think. It might start an hour earlier than normal RF time, which would be 5 p.m. Pacific, but we'll let everybody know if you want to keep up to date on all that stuff so that you don't get lost when we're uh, getting closer to the time. You can follow us on Twitter, at SYS on YT, or you can follow us at facebook.com forward slash start your systems. We'll be letting you know all about that. However, uh, real life nationals, um coming up yeah i mean 21st of may um will be the hangtown classic 
boy, oh boy, I don't know what to think about the Nationals right now. It's uh, it's totally up in the air because Dungeons look great to end the Supercross Championship, and on paper, yes, he looks good to do uh, great outdoors again. But uh, I mean, Tomac decimated him for the first five motos last year, and Tomac looked really good on uh, some of the rougher tracks that we've had this season. So Tomac really might be the guy going into this one. Uh, Roxon obviously was going in healthy this year, so that might be a factor. And you got Muskan making his debut. Um, Baggett will probably be good. Anderson will probably be pretty good. Uh, Porcel is always going to be fast. He'll probably win every whole, uh, fastest lap award. But I still think it's going to be uh, Dunn, Gli, and uh, Roxon, probably the, the three guys outdoors this year. The only exception I would say is that I I wonder if Stu actually does enter the outdoors healthy. I think he has the speed to challenge all those guys, but what we've seen lately out of Stu, I just don't see it happening. Could. It could surprise us. And uh, could be an instant race winner, instant champ championship contender. But we'll just have to see. And then 250 outdoors... I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't really don't know what's going to happen with that because I would have said even though Martin's a two-time champion that Webb would have come into that championship on paper as the favorite. But now that he broke his, uh, I think it's called the scaphoid in his wrist. Um, don't want to be completely wrong there, but I, I believe that's what it's called. Uh, and he looked pretty off of it at Vegas, definitely probably hurting. Uh, that I wouldn't say Webb is the guy anymore. I think Martin is probably in a pretty good spot to win his third outdoor championship in a row. Um, uh, AC will be back and healthy. Adam C. and Cirillo, so he should be pretty good. We'll have the debut of Austin Forkner for that PC team. I don't know about Geico having any real contenders outdoors. Honestly, if I if I had to say one rider that I thought would be the, the best Geico rider, it, it might even be Jordan Smith. Because I don't think Mookie's racing outdoors. Hampshire's okay, but not like epic outdoors or anything. Jordan Smith is pretty good when healthy. Christian Craig is also really good, but I think uh, I see him in about fifth place this outdoor championship. I see Jordan Smith as being faster, but probably more inconsistent. And PC, like I said, AC and Forkner are probably going to be really good. Savachi's carrying a lot of momentum. Um, so those guys will probably be pretty good. Star, obviously, J-Mart and Webb, but I think Plessinger will probably be very fast as well. Probably will be a championship contender as he was in Supercross this year. They have A-Mart 2 this year. A-Mart won a moto at Bud's Creek last year, so he, he's on his game outdoors recently. Uh, Troy Lee KTM. Justin Hill catches fire, he'd be fast. Um, McElrath has been pretty good outdoors. Nelson will be back again, so he will actually probably be pretty good. Then uh, the Husky team, Zach Osborne's always pretty good outdoors, so I think he'll do well. That's about it, though. I don't. I mean, the Suzuki teams are going to be okay, I guess. Cunningham, probably the best 250 Suzuki rider I can think of outdoors. Shalia might be good, but he's been pretty hit or miss this year. I don't know. Like I said, if I'm going to pick a favorite for 250 Outdoors right now, I'd have to say it's J-Mart. I would have gone Webb, but until he got hurt at the end of the season, it's just kind of detracted me from really thinking that he's still going to be the guy. He could, but it'll be tough. But I'm excited to watch it. I'm sure you guys are as well. Lots of uh, awesome moto action going on around the world these days, in my opinion. Canada is actually... I, all of our Canadian fans out there, I uh, I would be smiling if, you know, ear to ear if I were you guys because Millsap's now coming to Canada, been confirmed, and then you guys have Gurky defending his title up there against Fasciati and... Medaglia, I think, is still racing in that class for Canada, but then you have uh, 
like Brett Metcalf up there. You have Alessi and Freeze going up. They're racing for Monster Energy Leading Edge Kawasaki up there, which is so weird to see the number 800 on a Kawasaki. Um, who else have they got up there? Uh, like I said, they have Medi. I definitely am missing a name or two, but I can't think of them at the moment. Canary is usually up there. We haven't seen Bobby Canary race in the States in a while. Um, 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 uh. But yeah, Canada's looking pretty epic this year for motocross, so. Feel, uh, feel happy for all you Canadian fans out there. If you're anywhere near a racetrack up there in the Great White North, gonna be some good outdoor action. All right, we've finished two GPs, but we're not done just yet. If you uh, stick with us here, we'll uh, go ahead and pick out a new bike or a new team, depending on which one is uh, preferred option here. So we continue on. 50 points, went 1-1, pulled almost, we're now uh, 84 points ahead of Jordi Tixier in the championship. So actually looking pretty good to wrap up the title early. That's cool, that's cool. All right, let's go ahead and go into customize and get a new bike, MX2 bike. I missed Kawasaki when I was naming the bikes earlier. What was I thinking? Um, well, I've seen more uh, requests for me to get a Honda than I have for me to get a uh, KTM. So I'm gonna get a Honda. And we get to see it all fresh and new. There she blows. So fresh. Okay. Let's go ahead and just upgrade her right off the bat. Start off with the race tech suspension, of course. Yes, sir. Race tech suspension. Um, uh, yeah, I got a pipe. What have I not used yet? I used Yosh. I use FMF. Um, Akropovic or Pro Circuit? Akropovic. Wow, $4,000 for an Akropovic pipe on these bikes. Whew. All right, upgraded that. Let's take a look at the graphics kits now. There's one set, the Blackbird Honda. Fancy. We got HG stickers. That looks pretty neat, the red, white, and blue. Basic, a little bit more out there, semi-basic. It's going to have the retro Honda at the end, which actually looks pretty sick from what I can see. It looks more like a factory bike these days. And then the retro stuff, nice with the purple shroud with the little tear in it. Stuff looks cool. All right, what else we got? Stellar MX with these crazy different looking graphics kits. Very uh, unique style. Interesting. And WLMMX, which has pretty much the same standard graphics kits throughout. It's got this like American one. Pretty much standard bike looks there. I actually have pretty good looking Honda setups, if I do say so myself. Hmm. Interesting. All right, let's go back to HG stickers. I think they had the best setups. Let's see, what do I want? I really like pretty much all red Hondas. <sighs> kind of like that. Um, 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 uh. Blackbird Hondas do look good too. Or do I want to go with just like one of these? Like this looked good. Or uh, this one, sorry. Kind of like the look of that too. I'm going to run with that one. Looking good, looking good. Do I have enough for hand guards? Go with like uh, circuit hand guards. I do have enough hand for hand guards, that's interesting. What do those red guards look like? P. Diddley. Polisport ones, maybe? They just don't look like they match the bike. 
Uh, maybe these. Uh, that's a little better. But uh, rental. Yeah, I'll go with the rental ones. Whatever. Don't think I'll have enough for rims. That would have been my next purchase. Let's see. I do. I do, I do, I do. It be, it be, it be. I actually like silver rims on Hondas, though. Get blue or whatever. Warp 9! I think the red on the Hondas is probably a bit too much. I really think the silver looks actually pretty good, though. I just think the black makes it look too, uh, too dark, too... Yeah, kind of ghetto-ish looking. Should have multicolored tires. Silver and red. Oh, uh, no. Go with some DIDs. I didn't know rims improved handling. Interesting. Alright. Got a Hondi. Looking good, looking good. And that's going to wrap it up. Let's see what GP we have coming up next. Next race we will have is Udavala. So I haven't done Udavala yet. I'm excited to do that. If you guys like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode, which will be part 8 of our MXGP2, uh, the official motocross video game, uh, career mode game playthrough here on Star Systems. We'll see you guys then.